Hey guys, Dr. Brandon Crawford here. I'm the founder of the Austin Center for Developing Minds. Uh, we are located just north of Austin, Texas in Cedar Park. And what we do is we focus on developmental functional neurology. Hopefully you'll have a chance to catch my lecture because I'm going to be taking you through what that process looks like and why it's so important to focus on rehabbing the brain in the right way uh, at the right time with the right frequency and oscillations and all this kind of stuff, right? So I'm very honored to be a part of this conference. Uh, this conference is very meaningful. I love all the people involved and obviously the cause is fantastic. So thank you again and I look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Kate Labiner, with Child Neurology Consultants of Austin, and I am going to be talking about concussions, how to identify them, evaluation, and then return to play, especially focusing on how to do this in young athletes and younger people and young adults. So when we talk about a concussion and how that happens, it's any traumatic brain injury that can be caused to a blow really anywhere in the head. The classic example is when your head hits something and stops really quickly, and then your brain still moves within your skull and actually will hit the front of your skull and then can kind of bounce around in between them. But it can be any kind of torsional force as well. So it can be the twisting motion that happens really fast in the head or anything else. It's any time that your brain can really move and hit the front or the back of your skull. So when we talk about how common this is, it's incredibly common. Sports-related concussions occur to about 44 million children each year in organized sports. We have 170 million adults engaged in physical activity or sports, and up to almost 4 million sports-related traumatic brain injuries seen every single year. What we know about this is that children and adolescents are more prone to slow recovery, which then obviously complicates their improvement. The other things that we know that come complicated in younger people, but also can be seen in older adults too, is the susceptibility of females. So what we know is that structurally, the female body is actually more prone to getting concussions. The necks are longer, our ligaments are also often looser, leaving us more open for whiplash injuries. There's also um, a lower reporting in males, which is thought to be one of the reasons that you quote unquote see more concussions in women in certain areas like in soccer, for example. Um, but that is becoming a less and less common as there's been a big push in the sports world to really open up to having concussions and what that means and really looking for them. Treating athletes is unique in comparison to treating other people. You have chronic underreporting of injuries in athletes. Um, you have sandbagging on baseline testing. So when they looked, for example, at the NFL, NFL guys in an anonymous survey actually admitted to sandbagging on their baseline cognitive testing. So what that means is you intentionally do poorly on the baseline test. So then if you were to get a head injury, the amount uh, that you'd have to score on the test to be at your baseline baseline is lower than what your baseline actually is. On top of that, this gets complicated by a pressure to prematurely return to play. But when we, you return to play before we're completely healed, you may um, end up with prolonged recovery and other medical complications, whether that be post-concussive syndrome, migraines, things of that nature, that then can complicate your long-term recovery. When we talk about the short-term consequences of concussions, I think a lot of people are very familiar with what that looks like. Headaches, light and sound sensitivity, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, trouble with balance, changes in your vision, but they can also be some of the things that we don't necessarily think about regularly or talk about, like irritability, depression, anxiety. If you have a patient who already has these things, a head injury can exacerbate any of their underlying conditions. 
Sleep can be profoundly affected by head injuries, both in the positive and the negative. We see kids who report that they are sleeping significantly more than they were prior to their head injury. And then some kids who can't fall asleep or don't sleep as well. It can also affect you cognitively, which is really important in children because they're in school. Their concentration can be off. Their memory and processing speeds can be much slower. Their memory is often lower and they'll tell you they can't remember things like they used to. They can feel slow down or foggy. And any of these signs or symptoms should raise concern to be evaluated for a head injury. And these signs and symptoms may not all be there at the immediate time of the injury. Oftentimes what we see is that especially if you're an athlete and performing in, for example, a game of some sort, that the adrenaline may be quite high and you may not have symptoms right away. And those symptoms may develop over the next day or two days after the injury rather than being there right away. When we talk about what happens inside the brain, looking at a neuronal level and what happens to the metabolic integrity of a neuron, and this is just showing kind of how the neurons work, you have this increased energy demand and glucose consumption that are needed to run the pumps in a desperate attempt to restore the equilibrium that has been knocked off by the head injury. But this gets countered by decreased energy production and reduced brain blood flow and nutrient supply. So you have increased demand with lower access anytime you get an injury. That leads to problems in the neurons re-equilibrating themselves, helping them to heal. And a worst case scenario is axonal disruption, which would be right there. And if you were to get an actual tear in an axon, um, or even cell death, if they can't get the energy and the nutrients that they need in order to compensate for that metabolic change that happened because of the injury. We also know when they look at rats, and this is done um, looking after the head injury in rats, and then the hours and then days after the injury, and what happens in each, um, in their neurons, and looking at the cascade in that, that you have these both very acute corrections to the metabolic cascade and then long-term ones. So something that takes days in rats is known to take weeks in humans. So this is why we often don't see that kids get better right away and it can take weeks for them to really start to feel better. So recovery time following concussion has been studied immensely. And really, and when they looked at collegiate football players, what we saw was that 90% are going to be symptom-free and have cognitive recovery within seven days um, after their injury. Now, I usually say when I talk to patients, I give them a month um, because most people are in that seven to 14 day range. But if you're longer than that, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are worse. It's just taking your body longer to correct all of these changes and to recover than it would from other uh, somebody else. So much like if you were to hit your arm and get a bruise there, one person the bruise may resolve in a couple of days and somebody else may have it for a couple of weeks, but yet the injury was the same and the size of the bruise was the same, but each body is going to handle it in its own way. But we do know that there can be long-term neurologic defi deficits from a single concussion. What we see is that in high school athletes, when they've studied it, their reaction time can take up to 21 days. So that's three weeks to recover. Their verbal and memory, um, their verbal memory and motor skills can take up to two weeks. Their cognitive and emotional recovery can be there for five weeks afterwards. And you can actually see long-term impairment, especially seen in memory and processing skills speeds and ability to focus and pay attention. The thought is that why that may not be as obvious as you continue to go is that kids will start, and adults too, will start to adapt to their own deficits. So if you have a very, very mild memory deficit, you may come up with a new way to remember things so that, that deficit is not so obvious long term. So how long does it really take for a brain to recover after one or more concussions? So when you look at this, the open circles are a single concussion here, and then the the colored in diamonds are double concussions, and then these are all the controls. So when you looked at um, the kids with double concussions, what they saw was that they were not back to their baseline as quickly. Um, and this is both from a metabolic and a symptom standpoint, um, as people who had a single concussion or no concussion at all. 
When we also look at subconcussive hits, which has been a big concern, especially in the football world, right? Linemen have subconcussive hits. And when you watch football, you'll see the kind of what we call obvious concussions in wide receivers and running backs where they're like taken out in the middle of, you know, the field and it's very obvious something has happened. The subconcussive hits are the ones that come from them just constantly hitting their helmets with somebody across the line. And what they've shown is when we look at fMRI studies, which look at the its functional imaging of the brains themselves, we see that brains prior to the season um, are more active than brains in season. And these are, are done in people who did not report concussions during um, their football. We also know that exercise can be immensely important. Physical exercise has been shown to help restore healthy homeostatic regulation of stress. And this is brain stress. It also helps induce anti-apoptotic, which are the effects that will lead to death of neurons. Also helps you to maintain your blood-brain barrier um, and protects you against vascular risk factors which can worsen injuries, like if you had hypertension, diabetes, things like that. It also changes your cerebrovasculature. Um, so you get increased blood flow, you get new vessels developing if there has been any injury to vessels, you also get improvement in any vascular disease which may be underlying. So it also helps your brain be more plastic. And when we use that expression in neurology, what we're talking about is the ability of the brain to learn and change. And that helps you then improve your neurocognitive performance. So exercising after an injury is actually much more important than was originally thought. And when we talk about the return to play, we're going to come back to this idea of why it's important to actually get moving again. We also know that changes in blood flow happen while you exercise, that you change the way your cerebral autoregulation for your blood pressure, you change the blood flow, um, you change the metabolic rate, and also the brain's ability to clear out um, carbon dioxide and other nutrients it doesn't need or things that waste that has been used and developed. So prolonged rest after head injuries can actually lead to deconditioning. Deconditioning can then induce changes in a negative way to your cerebral blood flow, which can lead to persistent symptoms in some people. Making a return to play, even if you aren't an athlete, really important and getting people back to moving around and doing things, even when they may not feel 100% better, so important. There's also evidence showing that exercise training can reduce symptoms, and this is something we hear clinically, that as you can, as you exercise, some kids will actually get res resolution of their symptoms when they have them when they're not working out. When we talk about really what do you do from an exercise standpoint after you've had a head injury, we know that beyond the first couple days, it may inhibit your recovery rather than aid it. Um, it's also well documented if you're removing people from their social and physical routines, that that can have a psychological effect that can worsen depression and lead to further deconditioning. And deconditioning is that state of your body where you're not in as good of shape as you used to be. So we want to really encourage voluntary exercise, never forcing people to do things that they don't feel up to, but really doing what you're capable of after an injury, whether it be walking around the house, walking around the block, riding a stationary bike. We're not saying go run a mile, but doing anything that gets your blood flowing will help rather than just laying in bed. We know too that as you recover from a concussion, it's not just the symptoms, not just the headaches, it's not just the nausea, the dizziness, but also cognitively, you're going to start to recover. So what this slide shows is that as people reported decrease in their symptoms, they continue to have cognitive improvement and cognitive symptoms that lasted for a week to two weeks after. So what that means is that your cognitive and emotional recovery is lagging in comparison to your symptomatic recovery. So oftentimes we'll see your headaches are gone, your light sensitivity is gone, but yet you're still irritable and you feel like you may not be producing the same way, whether it be in school or at work, as you used to, and that is actually expected.
When we talk about aerobic uh, exercise and neuronal injury, like we were talking about, aerobic exercise can reduce your neuronal injury, promote, promote neuronal survival. It enhances production of your neuroprotective factors. Um, if you do it too early after an injury, it can impede your recovery. But if you wait too long, it can also impede your recovery. And when you look at what a TBI can lead to when we're talking about the neurostructural alterations, metabolic shifts, impaired metabolism, um, um, vascular autoregulation changes, and all these different things, what we know is that exercise and cognitive use can actually help all of that long term. Now, when we talk specifically about concussions and how we handle concussions, each state is a little bit different. Now, there, every single state has some sort of concussion law, and that's including DC. However, what you see is none of them mandate baseline testing. Baseline testing is very important for us in neurology because otherwise I'm comparing you against nothing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. In Texas, we have a law that was signed in 2011 um, that required concussion education for coaches and trainers, as well as clearance by a physician before you return to play. Now that doesn't have to be a neurologist, but it does have to be a physician. Baseline testing has become much, much more common. Um, you have some of the common baseline tools like impact testing, um, and these have been validated. And they're used also by the professional and collegiate organizations, the NCAA, NFL, NHL, MLB, WWE, US soccer, then that includes MLS and NASCAR all require baseline testing. So after a concussion, what do you do? You're going to see changes. You're going to have rapidly evolving symptoms. Some of them may require medical evaluations. Some don't. If you see something that looks like a seizure, we automatically would say that you need to be evaluated. If you have loss of consciousness greater than one minute, that also requires emergent evaluation. If they are unable to perform um, the remove from play protocol, then we'd also recommend emergent evaluation. So those are questions that they'll ask on the sidelines. And if they're if athletes are reporting a high symptom burden or unable to answer the questions, that becomes very concerning. I, we always say if you are uncomfortable with how someone looks after a head injury, it becomes very important to have them evaluated. Otherwise, what we recommend is cognitive and physical rest for 24 to 48 hours. We say reduce screen time. And you'll notice there, there's something very important. It says reduce, not none. For some people, it's not that they're unable to tolerate anything, but they're unable to tolerate as much as they could. Um, so we do want to remove them from anything that makes them feel worse, but you don't have to completely cocoon yourself in a dark room and without a phone, without a TV, not talking, not doing anything, unless that's the only place you feel okay. There used to be this thought that you had to keep people awake overnight. That's not true anymore. So you don't need to keep waking them up all night long after an injury. Um, we do want them to be seen though as soon as possible, whether that's by a pediatrician, by internal medicine or family medicine, or by neurology. There are return to learn and return to play protocols which are in place to help. So what we do is we're going to have a symptom checklist that's going to be used to determine kind of where you are. We also then add in that computerized testing like impact testing um, and you're going to repeat the post injuries comparing it to the baseline. Now you want everyone if your child has had a copy of their baseline testing to have a copy of that on you um, to make sure that then you could take it and we'd be able to look at it versus what they have right now. Um, a player with a diagnosed concussion is not allowed to return on the same day of their injury. So when in doubt, they're going to sit out because we know that youth athletes are more susceptible to concussions and are going to take longer to recover. A return to play is a staged return, starting with that no activity, meaning rest and recovery. And then every 24 to 48 hours, you're going to slowly increase. Now, you only increase to the next level when you have been symptom free for that 24 to 48 hours in between. It starts with light aerobic exercise walking, swimming, stationary bikes. You just want to increase the heart rate a little bit to improve all of those things that we talked about when we said that aerobic and um, exercise can improve your blood flow, improve your ability to clear waste, improve your metabolic function. That's the importance. Now, 
Next, you're going to go to sports specific exercise. That's going to be light uh, lifting. It's going to be maybe some skating drills. If you're a hockey player, you may jog a little bit. If you're a soccer or football player or lacrosse player, then next you're going to go to non-contact training drills. So that's going to be passing drills. Um, also then more higher resistance training. And then that's really aiming to really start working on your exercise, your coordination and your cognitive load. Because once you start getting in the situations where you're in drills with other people, it's now also adding in reaction time and response to other things happening around you. Next would be full contact practice that would include scrimmages and then a complete return to play after that. Really what a return to play is doing is allowing us to determine that an athlete is asymptomatic before they're starting more exertional activities. Um, and it's utilizing this progressive approach before just throwing them back into what they did. Part of that is because what I talked about with that second hit theory, if you get hit again, the chances that you worsen and that it takes you significantly longer to recover are higher. So what do we do if there's no baseline testing, right? We recommend that you bring baseline testing to us. We recommend that kids have baseline testing. What do you do if you don't? What we'll do then is watch a time recovery curve, meaning we're going to keep testing you and then see kind of where your curve is and determine then is it that you may have a slight residual impairment or is it just that that was maybe your baseline? The problem with this is it leads to what we call guesstimation, where I'm comparing you against normal kids. This is especially problematic if you have a child with an underlining learning disability, whether that be ADHD, dyslexia, something like that, because that will skew their baseline testing in one direction. Action. And while it may not be a residual impairment, it may be something that was always there. So it makes the baseline testing even more important for those kids. So ultimately, what do we know? The impact of concussions is variable. We know that young athletes especially are more susceptible to the effects of their concussion, and they're also going to have less access to specialized care. Obviously, if you're in the NFL, you have access to anything you like, right, and can pay for any specialist that you need. That's not always true for our younger kids, and also it may not be as easy, right, because you can't just take yourself to the doctor. Recovery from concussion is variable for every person. If you've seen one concussion, you've seen one concussion in that kid. And even a concussion in the same child may look very different, even if there's a similar mechanism to the injury. The physiologic abnormalities may persist for weeks, even after the symptoms subside, meaning that you may not feel like yourself. You may feel foggy. You may feel irritable, and that would also be normal. The utility of that mandatory rest period is really debatable, and especially in kids, the social aspects of being at school or being with your team, even if you are not practicing or not able to play, become very important. There are prevention protocols. These vary. Um, baseline testing is required at the professional and the collegiate level, and we're really pushing this in younger kids as well. And anytime that anyone's interested, we also do this in our office. But there is no mandated baseline testing in youth athletes. Um, we also know that concussion treatment protocols are variable. Um, cognitive and physical rest are the mainstays. But when we say rest, we don't mean doing nothing. What we mean is not pushing yourself. Thank you so much for all of your attention and let us know if there's anything that we can do to help.